Well, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I don't know that I've formally met uh, all of you yet, and so um, we'll start with a prayer, and then I'll get into some introductions, and then and then we'll go from there. Okay. All right. So uh, let's all pray together. Okay. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Well, again, thank you all for coming tonight. You'll notice the screen is not on. Um, I have a, I, I was debating whether or not to use the screen tonight and, uh, and, you know, sometimes I, I use a lot of PowerPoint slides and sometimes I don't and, uh, and I, I decided, you know, we'll, we'll try something a little different this time. So, um, and I'm, I'm always open to feedback. So if any of you have any, any thoughts and you're like, you know, next time, you know, put together a PowerPoint, then please let me know. I did notice that a number of you take a lot of notes. So I took the liberty of putting together a handout that has a lot of references on this. So go ahead and please pass that around. Um, it's, a, it's not exactly the order in which we're gonna cover everything tonight, but you know, most of the material we're gonna cover tonight is in, those, uh, is in those notes. And so please feel free to scribble on there. Uh, I put in some of, the, some of the references and sources, some of the other ones I, I didn't put in specifically, but you know, a lot of this information is available widely in a number of places. So, um, for background information, I, I just want to introduce myself formally. My name is Demetrio Aguila. Uh, I'm a, you know, my wife and children and I uh, are members of the, of the parish here at St. Peter's. Uh, we've been members here for, I think, about two and a half years now since we moved down to the Omaha area. Um, we're formerly from, uh, from Norfolk up in northeast Nebraska, and then prior to that, uh, the Air Force took me all over the world. So um, as far as my background for all of this goes, I'm currently in formation for the permanent diaconate. Uh, I'm in the first year, so they haven't kicked me out yet, so, so far so good. Um, <laughs> And uh, I'm just finishing up my, uh, my degree in theology at the Augustine Institute. I, I keep postponing my comprehensive exam. I'm kind of nervous about it. And so uh, the deadline is December 15th. So please pray for me. I, uh, I have from now, actually from the beginning of September until December 15th to finish it. And I just keep saying that tomorrow, 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 because I'm nervous. Anyway, um, please pray for that. And then... Uh, and again, just so you have a context within which to understand all of this, uh, I also uh, am kind of an amateur apologist. I've uh, I've done parish missions and talks. Uh, I think in I think I've done it in seven states and five foreign countries now. So um, speaking about the faith is something that I really enjoy. It's something I get excited about. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, like many of my many of my mentors, like you know, like Dr. Scott Hahn and Tim Staples, I. I tend to, to get so excited that I don't always cover all the stuff I want to cover, and then you have to jam a whole bunch of stuff in at the end, which is sometimes I think where the PowerPoint presentations help. They help keep me on track, which is the reason I put together the notes, so I can say, okay, I, got, I, I can't just stay on the first page, okay? Um, as we were talking about before everybody showed up, uh, oh, and by the way, if you're curious, I, I have a podcast. I can give you some more information about that. It's called How to Speak Catholic, um, and, and you can get a, a sense. It, yeah, we cover a bunch of different things, including uh, I did some interviews with various people who have come into the church. You know, a, a friend of mine who's a Hebrew Catholic, how he went from being a practicing Jew to now a, a Hebrew Catholic. I uh, interviewed a, a friend of mine who is a, who's a religious sister and how she came to understand and, and know her vocation. Um, you know, various people, different walks of life. And then some of the other talks focus on you know, parish missions, and there's a nice mishmash of stuff. So I invite you to check that out, tell your friends about it. Um, for tonight, we're going to go over a very, very brief, and I mean brief, overview of the Second Vatican Council, okay? Um, you know, as we were talking about before, uh, before we started, um, 
you know, there was, there was a question among some people, not just you, but a lot of people, like, how can you spend a whole year just talking about the Mass? I mean, what is there to talk about? But, you know, as Deacon DeLuca mentioned, I mean, we could take any one of these nights and turn it into an entire year. It's so rich. There's so much stuff. I, I just came back from Milwaukee for work, and, and I, was, I had the opportunity to attend a Melkite Catholic church. Um, and and experience the divine liturgy the way it's the way it's celebrated in the Eastern Rite, you know, using the um, the liturgy of uh, of Saint John Chrysostom. Uh, I mean, it's like fifteen hundred years old. This is the way they've been celebrating the liturgy for the last fifteen centuries. It was absolutely beautiful, and you know, and and and. You know, to, to see how that meshes with how we celebrate our liturgy here, uh, it, it was just breathtaking. And, and I'd like to, we're going to touch on a little bit of that tonight, but mainly the focus is on the Second Vatican Council. Okay. So, by way of hands, how many of you have heard of the Second Vatican Council? Not everyone. Okay. All right. Everybody. Okay. <laughs> how many of you have read? at least excerpts from the documents of the Second Vatican Council. Okay. How many of you have read any of the documents in their entirety? Okay. All right. That's, that's pretty typical. Okay. Um, so I would invite you, after we're done tonight, to to take a look at these documents. They're all available for free on, on the internet. You can go to the Vatican website and they're there. I mean, you can read it in a bunch of different languages. I suspect most of you will want to read it in English, but I mean, it's available in Latin, Italian, Spanish. Uh, Bulgarian was one of the ones that I saw. I mean, it's a whole bunch of different languages. Um, and we're going to go over some of that tonight. I think you will find, after what we go over tonight, uh, that there are the, the Second Vatican Council has been the subject of much discussion uh, since the council closed in the late 1960s, okay? Um, actually, it was the mid-1960s. Uh, and much of that discussion has, has resulted in the council getting credit and blame for all kinds of stuff that's happened in the church since then. Uh, and some of it is well-deserved, and some of it is way off the mark. We don't have time tonight. It's outside of the scope for us to go through all of that. The purpose for tonight is to kind of set up the discussion for next time when we're going to focus and zoom in on one of the documents of the Council, okay, as it pertains to the Eucharist and as it pertains to the Mass. But I want to kind of give all of you a a big overview, okay? So <clears throat> what was the Second Vatican Council? Obviously it was a council, it was an ecumenical council um, that was called by a pope, and it was the second one that took place in Vatican City. So different ecumenical councils are typically named after where they were held, okay? So the Council of Ephesus was held in New Jersey, right? No, Ephesus, exactly, okay? The Council of Carthage was held in Carthage, right? And so forth and so on, fill in the blank. And so this was the second council that had been held in Vatican City, okay? Um, the first one was uh, the, obviously the first Vatican Council. Um, and the focus of the first Vatican Council, for those of you that don't remember, um, a big focus was papal infallibility. Okay, there's a number of other things that they addressed as well, but that was uh, one of the big things. <clears throat> now, the Second Vatican Council didn't just kind of pop out of nowhere. De novo, like, you know, Saint, uh, Pope St. Saint John the Twenty Third didn't just say all of a sudden, hey, you know what, I don't think we're doing anything next week, let's have a council. Okay, that wasn't how it happened. There was an evolution leading up to this council, and a lot of people would argue that the process that kind of started off the movement toward the Second Vatican Council actually began before the First Vatican Council. Uh, the seeds of the things that were discussed and addressed in the Second Vatican Council began way back then, and some people would argue even as far back as Trent, okay, uh, back in the, in the 1500s. And I'm going to try to bring some of that in and, and tie that together for you so that it hopefully makes some sense, okay? So I think one of the best ways to understand the purpose of the council and the, the, um, 
the, the backdrop is to hear the words of Pope John the 23rd himself, St. John the 23rd, in his purpose in calling the council, right? And so you'll see at the very beginning, um, his opening speech, I took a quote from uh, St. John the 23rd's uh, opening speech there, and he said, the supreme interest of, of the ecumenical council, meaning the one that he was opening up, um, is that the sacred deposit of Christian doctrine be guarded and taught in an increasingly effective way, okay? Now, that's a very pregnant statement. There's a lot of stuff in that statement. You know, it'd be easy to just read through it and say, okay, you know, so he wants to call a bunch of bishops together. Um, but in order to really understand what the council was trying to achieve, you have to understand the, the, the milieu in which all of these people found themselves at that time in the 1960s, okay? Um, and there was, there was an increasing sense amongst the, the hierarchy of the church, the clergy, and the laity that there was this growing divide between the clergy and the laity. Okay, uh, and that you know there were those who felt that uh, the people who were making decisions had lost touch with the people who were having to live with those decisions. Um, and you know, as we had talked about previously, you could see some of those elements in the mass as it was celebrated in the fifties and sixties, where you know you would have people show up, and the priest and the deacon and the subdeacon and the servers are up there at the altar uh, and in the sanctuary doing their thing. And then my grandmother is sitting there in the pew praying the rosary, doing her thing, because she has no idea what's going on up there. Well, that was a symptom of a, a larger cultural shift that had taken place over centuries. It didn't happen all of a sudden. It had kind of drifted in that direction. Um, and it became obvious to, to St. John that it was time to do something about it. Okay. Now that wasn't the only reason that he called the council. There were there were movements, um, you know, one, the, the biggest of which was uh, was modernism. Uh, and you'll see, I put a quote in there also uh, about modernism uh, that Pope Pius X said in 1907 in uh, Pascendi uh, Dominici. It's he described it as the synthesis of all heresies. Okay. And so you see, that's kind of kind of the the some of the genesis of the Second Vatican Council was to was to try to address these heresies uh, in a way that was most importantly accessible to the average Catholic, to the average Christian, to the average person who is curious about Christ. Okay. Um, there was a trend that had crept into uh, encyclicals and papal bulls, uh, and in some of the previous councils that, that really focused on technical jargon and technical aspects and, and academia. Um, and so it was, it was kind of like, you know, if you could imagine, you know, you, you, your, your ankle hurts. And it's been hurt, hurting for, you know, a month. And you want to know, well, why might my ankle hurt? And then you open up an orthopedic surgery textbook. I mean, how accessible is that going to be for the average person who has an ankle problem? And there, there was a sense in which the documents that the church was promulgating for purposes of the church's growth were becoming more and more and more technical, which was great for theologians, great for the clergy who had the training to understand that. But really out of reach for the average Catholic sitting in the pews. Uh, and it, it wasn't as, as um, it, it didn't lend itself to being a great tool for evangelization either. Um, combine that with this sense that, that scripture had, had it, that the church had kind of lost control of scripture. And I don't mean to say that the church actually you know, that that actually happened, but there was a perception among many people, and it still lingers today, that, well, we have, we have the church, and you non-Catholics have the Bible. And there was this, this sense in which people had forgotten that the, the Bible is a Catholic book. It was put together 
by the church, for the church, for use in the liturgy. Uh, and, and so you'll notice, and this is in the handout as well, a big focus of the Second Vatican Council was to make sure that the documents that were published and approved were written in such a way that anybody could read it. And with a, with a strong emphasis on terminology and vocabulary, which was more scriptural and, and less scholastic, um, and that was, had a focus that was more pastoral and less academic, which is not to say that there wasn't doctrine, that there wasn't important theology contained therein, but it was presented in a way that the average person could read it. So, uh, and, and we'll go over, remind me at the end if I don't, if I forget to do this, um, I have a suggestion as to how you might want to approach the documents of the Second Vatican Council. If you're really curious after tonight and you want to say, okay, you know, I, I want to dig into this. Um, there's a certain order in which you may want to read them in order to get the most out of them because some of them lend themselves to setting you up for other ones, okay? And so we can go over some of that later on tonight, okay? Now there's a, there's a misperception that because the focus was pastoral and, you know, both Pope John the, St. John the 23rd and, and, and Pope, uh, Pope Paul the 6th use that term to describe the council that, oh, well, it's pastoral, it's, it's not authoritative. There's, there's no doctrine in this. It's, it's just, uh, you know, how do we make people feel welcome and good about themselves? And it's just a bunch of suggestions. Well, nothing can be farther from the truth. And, and I hope to, you know, to cover some of that tonight. Okay. So let's go through some of the specifics of the council itself. All right. So when was the, um, you'll see on the second page, actually on the third page, there's a timeline. Okay. And we're going to get to that in a second here. Um, and so I want you to, you can use that as kind of a, a reference for when we're talking about all of this, okay? Um, but when we, when we think about the council, you know, everybody says, oh, Vatican II, Vatican II, Vatican II, Vatican II. What does that mean exactly? Okay, what does that mean? So it was an ecumenical council that, in, that was called by St. John the XXIII, um, and it, was, it involved two popes, okay, some of you may know that. Some of you may not remember that. Okay, so John the Twenty Third opened the council, but he died before the council closed. And so Paul the Sixth was the one that closed the council, and that's where um, Pope John Paul the First took his name, because he, for him, his focus really was all of the stuff that the council wanted. To, to really bring forth. And he said, okay, this is gonna be my focus. And so he chose the names of the two popes that kind of sandwiched the council. So that he could say, look, I want, to, I want my pontificate to embody what the council was trying to teach. Uh, and then obviously, uh, St. John Paul the Great picked that up and, and then he ran with that. And, and I think in a lot of ways we can, we can see the fruits of that, particularly in the, in the um, in the, uh, in the catechism of the Catholic Church, which draws heavily from the Second Vatican, from the documents of the Second Vatican Council. Uh, with, and not to the exclusion of the other, you know, the other conciliar documents, but let's go through some details here. So the council um, produced 16 documents. You'll see a list of them there, okay? And they're divided up into three categories. There are constitutions, and then there are what are called declarations, and then decrees. In, uh, decreasing order of precedence. Okay, um, just you know, I, I looked up some statistics before we got together tonight. I want to share some of them with you here. Okay, so how many people would you guess were involved in the Second Vatican Council over the course of the? So it opened in 1962 and then it closed in 1965. So over the course of three years, if you had to guess, rough number. 120, you said? 500. Okay, these are all good guesses, all right? Two popes, 
somewhere, the number not, is not exact, but somewhere between 24 and 2,500 bishops and cardinals. Uh, a whole bunch of priests and deacons, they didn't number, in the statistics I found, they didn't list how many priests and deacons. And a whole bunch of lay people. There were 43 lay observers who were non-voting members, but they had input into, the, into what the council ultimately produced uh, and also were there to serve as witnesses to what the church was doing. Not to mention all the non-Catholics that were invited. There were Jews. There were Orthodox Christians. Um, there were non-Christians, atheists that were invited, many of whom attended. Uh, not every one of the bishops was able to attend. There were, I think, according to the statistics, I read about 2,900 bishops at the time. Um, about 24 to 2,500 of them were able to attend. I mean, that's, that's a pretty big deal. You know, so, and every single document had to be approved by a two-thirds majority. So that's a lot of consensus. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine, I mean, how many of you have children? How easy is it if you ask them, what do you guys want for dinner, to, to get them to agree on dinner? And, and it, it may be four or five, ten of them, you know, for those of you that have big families. I mean, that's nothing compared to 2,400 bishops and cardinals. You know, I mean, can you imagine the bishops and cardinals that we have today agreeing on anything? You know, with a two-thirds majority, you know, based on some of the things that we've seen in the in the media, which obviously has its own particular perspective. But it's it's hard to conceive of that. I mean, you know, we have a Senate with a hundred senators, and they can't agree on a two-thirds majority of anything. And yet here we have the Holy Spirit guiding the council and twenty-four hundred bishops, of which sixteen hundred have to agree in order for any document to be approved. That's a pretty big deal, okay? And so um, I, I want you to, to, to think about that as, as we move forward through this. So you read these documents, this is something that the vast majority of the bishops who attended and the voting members who attended agreed on, okay? People like Carol Wojtyla, okay? Priests who had input like Joseph Ratzinger, okay? And then people who, and priests and others who strongly influenced the council, people like St. Jose Maria Escrivá, who you, you can see his influence throughout all the documents of the Second Vatican Council, particularly in Lumen Gentium, okay? And we'll, we'll cover some of that too, all right? Um, but I thought having those statistics to put all of this in context would help you understand the scope of what they were trying to accomplish, okay? So, let's see, uh, there are a few other statistics that I thought you might, you might find fascinating. Um, so as far as attendees go, there were, they represented 79 countries, 38% from Europe, 31% from the Americas, 20% from Asia and Oceania, and 10% from Africa. Compare that to the First Vatican Council, which was roughly 100 years earlier, where instead of 2,400 council fathers, there were 737, okay? Almost all of whom were from Europe. And then at the Second Vatican Council, about 250 of the bishops that were in attendance were native-born Asians and Africans. At the First Vatican Council, none of them were. So you could see there's this big shift to try to, to try to get the whole church involved as opposed to you know, a top-down approach in which the Italians say, this is the way it's going to be. Okay? The vast majority of our poets have, have been from Italy, right? Uh, it was a big deal that, that uh, the St. John Paul was elected because he wasn't Italian. You know, uh, I mean, the, the fact that Pope Francis and, and Pope Benedict were elected. I mean, again, you see this, this shift uh, that, that's a sign of, of things that were, that were happening in the world at the time. And so this is the, the backdrop for 
for the Second Vatican Council. Okay, so let's go through the list of documents. Actually, let's do this first. Let's go through the timeline. Um, okay, because I, I think there's some elements in the timeline that you'll find really fascinating. Okay, so St. John the 23rd announces the council after much prayer and thought in January of 1959. Okay, three years later, after getting all these bishops and priests and deacons and lay people all to get, you know, getting them all organized, the council opens, okay, uh, in October of 1962. And then barely a year later, the council approves its very first document, okay? And notice this document that they approve first is a dogmatic constitution. Okay, so if you go back to the other two pages where we see the three different kinds of documents that they produced, you have constitutions, you have declarations, and you have de decrees, right? The constitutions are the ones that are the biggest deal, all right? They're the ones that have the greatest impact, and they're the ones that have the most to say, okay? And so the very first document that the church, that the council fathers approved was Sacrosanctum Concilium, which is what we're going to be covering over the next, you know, over the next month or so. Okay, that is a big deal. Okay, and I don't want to steal Deacon De Luca's thunder, but I, I will give you a little bit of a preview. The reason that that document was the very first one that was approved, and some of you may find this shocking because I know I did when I first learned it, it was because it was the easiest one for them to agree on. Okay, you know, we, we hear a lot of debate about the liturgy today, right? We hear it from all kinds of circles. We see it on, on, on social media. We see it on YouTube. We see it on Catholic Answers. We see it on EWTN. And yet, in 1963, that was the thing that the bishops agreed on most easily, was what do we want to do with the liturgy? Okay. And so keep that in mind as we think about the impact of the Second Vatican Council and what the, what the council did, what the council didn't do, what the council tried to do, and what it did not attempt to do. Okay? And we're, we're going we're gonna to dive into that in the coming weeks. Okay? Real quick, and this goes back to what we talked about last time we met, or when we talked about liturgical reform. Part of the reason is there was 60 years of work that had gone into that. So by the time you got to the Second Vatican Council, all that work had been done. The bishops had all seen that. Hence, it was very easy to get through. Because, like, yeah, they talked about this for last couple exactly. decades. So it wasn't, it wasn't revolutionary in the council. Right, exactly. And so... You know, and, and, and you know, we'll get into that more in the coming weeks. Um, but think about the significance of that, okay? This, this is not, again, this is not just something just fell out of the sky and they said, okay, this is the way it is. Th there was a process that led to this. And, and the Second Vatican Council was the culmination of a whole bunch of different movements, which finally converged uh, at the behest of St. John the 23rd in order to produce the documents that we have today, the 16 documents we have today, okay? So that same date, Inter Mirifica was also approved, okay, and you'll notice uh, if you take a look at the list of the documents, okay, Inter Mirifica was one of the decre decrees. So in the, uh, in, the, in the hierarchy, that's the second tier, if you will, okay. Media of social communications, okay. Think about that. The way in which the church was reaching out to the world and communicating to the world was a topic of, of great concern to the Council Fathers, as was the liturgy. And they obviously made that a high priority by approving that early on and saying, okay, this is what we want the church to do in terms of communicating with the world, which, you know, which ties into it's interwoven in, in some of the other documents, which we're going to cover here in a second, okay? So then a year later, we get Lumen Gentium and Orientalium Ecclesiarum, okay? So Lumen Gentium, uh, you can see, is one of the dogmatic constitutions, okay, on the church, okay? And for those of you that don't know Latin, Lumen Gentium means the light of the people, okay? And the, the council documents uh, are typically, j just like our prayers, for instance, uh, they're typically named after the first few words in the document, 
in, in Latin, that is. Okay, it may not be the first few words of the document in uh, in English or in Russian or whatever other language, but it, they're always promulgated in Latin first. And so, um, Lumen Gentium is how that document opens. Just like you know, when we pray, when we pray uh, the Our Father, what do we call it? We call it the Our Father because the first two words are Our Father. Yeah, when we when we pray the Hail Mary, obviously. That one is obvious, the glory be, so forth and so on. You fill in the blank, right? Um, confidior, can we call it the confidior? Because in Latin, the very first word is confidior. Okay, I confess. Um, and, and so you see this, uh, this, this has been true of the, the, the council documents, the church documents for, for centuries now. Okay. Um, following that, we have in 1965, all the other stuff happens. Okay, in the course of a few months there. We have Gravisium Educationis, Nostra Aetate, um, Optatum Totius, uh, Perfecte Caritatis, Christus Dominus. Okay, and then in November that year, Dei Verbum, the Word of God. Okay, um, and then Apostolicam uh, Actuositatem, Gaudium et Spes, which is the final. Uh, dogmatic constitution, dignitatis humanae, and presbyterorum ordinis. There's two documents that I left out of the timeline because I could not find any source that said specifically when those two documents were finally approved by the council. Like even on the Vatican website, it doesn't say approved on this date. All the other ones say approved on this date. So if you're wondering, wait a minute, why are there only 14 documents here, but there's a list of 16 documents altogether, that's why. Okay, and I didn't want to assign a date and, and mislead any of you, okay? Um, and so let's briefly go through what each of these documents is called and then what they were, you know, what their focus was, okay? So if we go back to the first page of the handout, you'll see the constitutions, right? And so again, I listed these in, in descending order of precedence. So, so the first constitution that's listed there is Dei Verbum. This is just an alphabetical order. Um, the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation. And in summary, it's a proclamation of the gospel. Um, it's actually, it's, if, if you're gonna read the council documents and, you've not, and you're not familiar with them, this is the one I would recommend you start with, okay? Um, because it's it's very accessible. It's really great for prayer. Uh, if you're looking for some for some good reading for your prayer time for your holy hour, this is a good one. You know, if you focus on it, you can finish reading it in about an hour. Um, but it's rich. I mean, you're not going to read it once and they say, okay, I, that, that's all I needed. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff in there. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. It's one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite documents. Following that is Lumen Gentium. Uh, and this is the document where you see the, the greatest influence from St. Jose Maria Escrivá, okay, in the universal call to holiness, okay? Um, and a lot of people have called Lumen Gentium the hub of the Second Vatican Council, with all the other ones being the spokes. It's kind of the it's kind of the core. So you could think of De Verbum as the introduction to council documents, and then if you read Lumen Gentium next, then you'll get all the all the themes that get expounded. In, in the other documents, okay? That'll give you kind of the context in which to understand the other stuff. They dive into more specifics in each of the other ones, okay? And then, of course, we have Sacrosanctum Concilium, okay? Sacrosanctum Concilium is structured differently than Dei Verbum and Lumen Gentium. Lumen Gentium and Dei Verbum are both really great for meditative prayer, you know, it's just good spiritual reading. Sacrosanctum Concilium has elements of that, but it also has a lot of practical elements as well. We're going to do this. We're not going to do that. Uh, and so it, it doesn't flow the same way the other two do. So, um, you know, we'll dive into that as, uh, you know, in the, in the coming weeks. But um, I think, you know, just, just be aware, if you start with that one, it'll, it'll feel a little bit choppy compared to the other two. So I, I would recommend you save that until after you've read the other two first. Okay. Oh yes. Well there is that. Yeah. But yeah, before before we dive into it, please take a chance, please take a moment to look through it. Okay. Uh, but understand that it's not it, you know it's 
I, I wouldn't call it a how-to manual. Some people think it is, it's not, but there are elements of that. Like, you know, there's, there's a lot of practical uh, considerations and applications in the document. It's not just, you know, it's not just for um, like spiritual edification. Okay, there, there are elements of that as well, but it's, it's a mix of a, of a few different styles. Okay, so just, just be aware of that. Okay, all right, and as I mentioned, that was the one that was easiest for all of them to agree on. Uh, and, and so that's the why it was why it was uh, why it was approved first. Okay, um, and it also touches on you'll see on the second page here, and we're going to dive into this some more. Not just the Latin rite, but also addresses some of the questions that had come up in the Eastern rites. Okay, so for those of you that may not be as familiar, there are a number of different rites within the church. We're not talking rights as in the opposite of left, okay? Rights as in, you know, the root word for ritual, okay? Because different parts of the church grew up with different customs um, that reflected which, which part of the church they, you know, they, they, they sprouted from. You know, it's, it's largely considered that there were, there were four centers of the church very early on. Okay, and you can trace each of the different rites back to one or more of those centers. Some of them have influence from more than one. Um, and, and so the church, in its wisdom, um, elected to say, you know what? Those of you who are in India, uh, who were, you know, who were, who were um, evangelized by St. Thomas, you can continue to worship the way that St. Thomas taught you to worship. Okay, which is not the same way that St. John taught people to worship, or St. James taught people to worship in Jerusalem, as an example. Okay, there are very similar elements. The core elements are there across the board, but there are other elements which reflect the culture in which they grew up. Okay, uh, and so Sacrosanctum Concilium addresses some of that uh, for pr primarily for purposes of clarification. Okay, um, and, and it also reflected a desire on the part of John the 23rd to make sure that the Eastern rites, which are far outnumbered by the Latin rite, okay, in terms of the total number of Catholics who are Eastern rite Catholics versus Latin rite Catholics, like I, I can't remember the exact statistic, but I think it's over 95% of Catholics are Latin rite Catholics. Okay, it's a very small percentage of Catholics that are Eastern Rite Catholics, even though there's over 20 different Eastern Rites. Okay? Um, but it was important to, to St. John that they not be excluded and that their voices be heard because there are elements of the theology of the church which they bring forward, which are, which are more explicit in their liturgy and in the way in which they, you know, they, they teach that are more implicit um, in the Latin rite. As an example, there's a, there's a strong emphasis in the Latin rite on Christology, a big focus on Christ, right? As there should be, right? Um, whereas in the Eastern rites, you see a, a stronger emphasis on pneumatology as opposed to Christology. And so there's a strong emphasis on the Holy Spirit, Okay, not to the exclusion of Christ, but you see a greater emphasis on that. Uh, one of the things that struck me in the liturgy that I attended this weekend, uh, the divine liturgy, they don't call it the mass because mass comes from the Latin word that we hear at the end of mass, ite misa est. Okay, that's where we get the word mass from. So it's Latin. Okay, in the Eastern rites, they don't use Latin. All right. Um, so the Melkite church that I attended was the liturgy was predominantly in English, but there was some Greek in there, you know, much like we use some Greek in, in our liturgy. Um, and there was also Arabic because that the Melkite church grew up in a part of the world where a lot of people speak Arabic. Now, obviously, you know, in modern America, we associate Arabic with Muslims, but Muslims aren't the only ones that speak Arabic. And so there's a, you know, you see those influences there. Um, there was a very strong emphasis in the liturgy on the role of our Blessed Mother. Okay, it's more subtle in our liturgy in the Latin rite. It's much more explicit and much more, 
much it's 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 much more uh you see it woven throughout their liturgy this strong emphasis on the role of the blessed mother um and also there's a there's a there's a focus within the latin rite on the mass on the liturgy as a sacrifice okay and the sacrifice of christ as it pertains to our worship whereas in the eastern rite you have that element but there's an even stronger emphasis on resurrection and not just the resurrection of Christ, but our resurrection with him uh, through our baptism and, and through the other sacraments. And so you see those elements. These are elements that John the 23rd wanted to make sure weren't ignored, weren't pushed by the wayside uh, in calling the council. And he wanted to make sure that those things were recognized and brought forward for the entire church to see and, and, and so that we could all benefit from the fruits of that, okay? Then we have Gaudium et Spes, which, is, which can be translated joy and hope, okay? That's what the Latin means, joy and hope. Um, and, and this is where you see the focus on combating modernism, okay? So modernism uh, philosophically is, a, is kind of, a, a development of rationalism, okay? So, and of course you're thinking, okay, well, maybe I remember that from school, maybe I don't, all right? But let's just review, okay? So rationalism was this movement that came out of the Enlightenment in which there was this idea that, you know, maybe God exists. It started out with deism, right? So God exists, but he was this, he, he's this uh, divine watchmaker. How many of you have heard of that? that analogy, the divine watchmaker as, as a description for God, okay? So that's deism, which then led into rationalism, okay? So deism is the, this idea that God created everything like a watchmaker, he put it in motion, and then he stepped back, and he just let it do its thing, and God isn't involved in history, okay? He, he doesn't intervene in history. Yes, he started it, yes, there's a creator, yes, Aristotle was right, you know, and Aquinas after him in saying that there is an unmoved mover, there is an uncaused cause that got all of this started. But after that, he's very hands off. He's just like, okay, I'm going to start it all off and see what happens. Okay, so that was deism, which then led into rationalism, which denies anything supernatural. Okay, it doesn't deny, rationalism doesn't deny the existence of God. It just denies that there's any sign of the existence of God in our day-to-day -day life, which then eventually leads to what? Well, if you can't know that God exists in your day-to-day -day life, then how do you know that, that, I mean, does he exist at all, right? And then obviously you can see where that goes with, uh, with atheism, right? And so modernism encompasses all of these different things. Um, and, you know, even, even Pope, Pope Pius X in 1907, when he, you know, when he published, um, what was that, Pascendi Domenici, uh, one of his big concerns was the influence of modernism and atheism and the rise of militant atheism, which we saw where? In Germany and in Russia, which led to what? It led to World War I. Right? And then everybody said, oh, what was the Great War? It was the war to end all wars. We're done with war. You know, so then the League of Nations abolishes war, makes it illegal, and says, oh, you know, we're smarter than that. We're not going to have war anymore. And it worked, right? <laughs> no, because clearly we had World War II, right? You know, and it, it, you see Hitler, and you see Mussolini, and you see Hirohito, and you see, um, uh, and you see Stalin, you know, taking all of these all of these elements which had been foreseen by the church, had been seen by uh, had been see foreseen by Pope Pius X and others, and they said, "Look, th these are concerns. These are things we need to address." And so, much of what we see in the Second Vatican Council is a response to the events of the first half of the 20th century and saying, look, the reason we had World War I, the reason we had World War II, the reason we had the Korean War and continue to have all these conflicts is because we've forgotten who we are. We've forgotten where we're from. We've forgotten why we're here. And 
And Pope John recognized that part of the reason for that was this disconnectedness between those who studied theology and the faith and those who were trying to practice it. And so the primary focus of the Second Vatican Council in all of these documents was to reinvigorate the church, to make the theology and the teachings accessible again. And this is where we get the idea of the new evangelization. Okay, so the new evangelization wasn't something that St. John Paul came up with. The new evangelization is found in the Second Vatican Council, re-evangelizing the people who were formerly Christian. Okay, that's what the new evangeliz evangelization is. It isn't going into the darkest depths of, you know, of the pagan world that has never been exposed to Christ. It's going into our churches, going into our pews, going into the homes of our friends and family members who were baptized, but were never really made disciples, right? You know, if you take a look in, in Matthew 28, 19, Christ's very last words to us were what? Go forth and make disciples of a couple of nations, right? Is that right? A couple of nations, three, five, all. all nations, right? Go forth and make disciples of all nations. That was Christ's last command. There's no asterisk there, right? There's no exception clause there. There's no, well, if you're a priest, go forth and make disciples of all nations. If you're a nun, go forth and make disciples of all nations. If you're a theologian, there's no exception clause. That is a command. It's not a request. It's not a suggestion. It's a command to all of us who are Christian. Go forth and make disciples of all nations. Well, how can we make disciples if we're not disciples ourselves? And so that was the focus of the council was to say, okay, let's take this huge church that we have and re-evangelize those that have been baptized, whether it's in the Americas, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in Asia, Africa, Oceania, wherever. Let's re-evangelize those people, turn the baptized, not just into disciples. We start by turning them into disciples, but then we turn them into disciple makers so that they can then take on the next phase. Okay? That was a huge focus and emphasis of the Second Vatican Council. And that's why there's a strong emphasis on scripture. Okay? You'll find when you read these documents, I mean, you can't go a page without seeing multiple footnotes to, to all kinds of scriptural references. I mean, yes, there are references to other documents like Trent and, and Carthage and Ephesus and Constantinople and all these other, you know, the, all these other councils. You have a lot of that. Okay? And, and then there's lots of references to, to St. Thomas Aquinas's, um, uh, to, to the Summa, you know, and, and a whole bunch of other stuff. But more than anything, the Second Vatican Council references Scripture over and over and over and over again. Um, and you see that in Sacrosanctum Concilium. Uh, again, I, just a little preview. Okay? Um, and why is that? Well, partly because that's where, the, that's where we find much of the deposit of the faith is in the scriptures, right? Pope Benedict said that sacred, to, sacred tradition is nothing other than the church's infallible interpretation of scripture. Think about that. What is tradition? We, we, sometimes we get into these debates about sacred tradition, and, you know, and, and, and there's this, you, you hear this ongoing debate amongst non-Catholics, tradition versus scripture. Tradition versus scripture, they're pitting one against the other. Well, that's like saying, well, no, 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 no. I walk with my heel, not with my toes. No, no, no. You walk with your toes, not with your heel. Catholics, what do we do? We believe both and. It's both tradition and scripture. Why? Because they are the left and right hands, the left and right eyes, or you know, to paraphrase St. John Paul, the left and right lungs of the church, of the deposit of faith. Okay? And so that was the focus. And so, you know, a lot of Catholics felt that they weren't as familiar with Scripture as, as they thought they should be. I mean, uh, if you take a look, as we've covered 
before at the structure of the mass prior to the um, you know prior to the reforms, uh, there was very little emphasis on the Old Testament as an example. And now you can't go to a Sunday mass without hearing the Old Testament. Okay, um, there's a strong emphasis on the epistles and daily mass, but a lot of daily masses also feature the Old Testament. There's very little of the Old Testament in the Old Mass. And, and then even with the New Testament, the Gospels, there's very little from Mark and very little from, from Luke. A strong emphasis is on Matthew and John. Um, partly because, well, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> okay, but there, there are other reasons for that. But, um, you know, you'll, you'll see... You'll see these elements. These, these are the reasons that Sacrosanctum Concilium turned out the way that it did. Because there were areas where it was obvious that we needed more. We, as the people of God, needed to dive back into our rich history. And the church said, this is how we're going to do it. This is how we're going to revive Scripture. This is how we're going to revive the liturgy. This is how we're going to revive the church. This is how we're going to re-Christianize what has become a neo-pagan world. Okay, and it's it's kind of prophetic when you think about it. Okay, you take a look around you. I mean, most of us here grew up in a world which was generally pretty friendly to Catholics, particularly here in Nebraska. Um, but you find that that's less and less the case. Um, and the things that we grew up just taking for granted in understanding our faith, you can't assume that the average Catholic knows anymore. Okay? So, for instance, I might say, you know, I'll give you an example. Okay? So I'll start a phrase and you finish it, right? I'm pretty sure you guys will get this right. Okay? Our Father who art in... Okay? So the average Catholic can finish that, right? Hail Mary full of... Okay? The average Catholic can finish that also. But if I say to you, praise be Jesus Christ, now and forever, okay? Not quite as sure, right? Okay, or if I say to you, um, if I say something like, uh, what would be another good example? Uh, I, blessed be the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Okay, these are things, these are elements from scripture. I was just quoting the Psalms there for a second. Okay, um, these are things that when I was growing up as an altar boy, you know, the priest would say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. And everybody would say, who made heaven and earth? Because we just knew these things, right? But you can't assume that the average pew sitter knows those things anymore. And, and, but the council foresaw that. And so they said, okay, we need to, we need to start reintegrating these, these concepts, these ideas, these truths back into the life of the church so that the average pew sitter can go out and make disciples, right? Okay, so I'm not going to go through all of the rest of the documents. You can see there's some brief summaries there. What I would like to do in the time that we have remaining, I'd like to leave some time at the end for some questions also. But what I want to do, if you turn to the bottom of the third page, okay, I included here some myths and misunderstandings, okay, some of which you may be familiar with, some of which you may have heard before, some of which you might actually think. Okay, but I also put in there which document you could turn to to find out what the church actually said. Okay, so first thing, okay, and you'll, you'll notice this is broken up into two sections. There's a section here on myths about the Second Vatican Council in general, and then the last section is as a segue into our next meeting, myths about Sacrosanctum Concilium. Okay, so... Catholics have been instructed by some theologians not to take too seriously the institutional church. Okay? Because the Second Vatican Council did away with the hierarchy of the church. You know, we're all the same now. You don't need to worry about the hierarchy anymore. Bishops don't have the same kind of power and influence they used to have. And the Pope, you don't have to listen to him the way that you used to have to listen to him before. You know, the, the church doesn't make rules anymore. It just makes suggestions. Okay? Well, if you read Lumen Gentium, you'll find the truth about that. Okay. Uh, oh, here, this one's one of my favorite ones. Okay. There's no real difference between priests and the laity. 
Okay? And we have this clericalization of the laity and this laicization of the clergy. We're all the same. The church doesn't teach that. If you want more on that, again, look at Lumen Gentium. Okay? And St. John Paul the Great talked about that a lot too. That was, that was something that he really, really strongly emphasized. Okay? So ecumen ecumenism, we should just be nice when we're talking to other people about the faith. You know, and, and don't talk about things that are uncomfortable. And don't talk about things that they might disagree on. Okay? Just, just be nice. And, you know, and, and, and just, just give everybody warm hugs. You know, let's just all sit around, hold hands, and sing Kumbaya. Okay? Because that's what the Second Vatican Council said. We, we, we shouldn't be trying to evangelize people anymore. We should just, just be nice to them. Well, read Unitatis uh, Red Indigratio, and you'll find that the church actually said something different. Okay? The Second Vatican Council abolished and abandoned traditional apostolates. They abandoned, um, you know, religious orders and authority systems. And, and the, the Second Vatican Council also said, you know, nuns and religious, you don't need to wear habits anymore. Priests, you don't need to wear Roman collars or cassocks anymore. You don't need to do any of that stuff anymore. Just be just like the laity, you know. As we were talking about, there was a there was a church that I attended from time to time when I was in college, most of the time out of duress, um, in which the priest would show up, and his chasuble was kind of draped over a chair, a, a folded chair like this, near the altar. Okay, and so there was a big screen on one side of the altar, and then he had his folding chair on the other side of the altar, and then he would come up, he would process. Process is kind of maybe overstating it. He would come up for the beginning of Mass wearing his jeans and his T-shirt and his sandals. And he'd say, hey, everybody, how you doing? And he'd take the chasuble and put it on. All right, let's start the Mass. Okay? So a lot of people, you'll hear people say, oh, but Vatican II said that this is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to do stuff like this. We're supposed to do uh, coffee and donuts Masses. Okay, how many of you are aware of that? That um, in the late 1960s, there were parishes that were not using wine and not using bread, but were instead consecrating coffee and donuts because it was just a communal meal. And they said, well, everybody can have coffee and donuts. Not everybody can have wine. Because, second, because Vatican II said, well, this is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to make it more accessible. There, there were people that now there are these are isolated incident. That, that's an extreme example, but you know you don't, you don't have to look very hard to find examples of stuff like that happening. Okay, I'll give you a, a, a concrete example. Um, so my best friend, he's a convert. He was formerly a uh, a very very staunch anti-Catholic Protestant. Okay, and after much debate and wailing and gnashing of teeth, he became Catholic. And so he invited me to come to his, his, his reception into the church. And so I went to this church um, and, you know, it was one of these churches, what my kids like to call a circle church, okay, but a circle church in a way that I suspect none of you have actually seen before. Okay, so what most people here in Nebraska call a circle church is, you know, where you have an altar and then you have like the semicircle, maybe even two thirds of a circle and the priest is doing this the whole time right? This church really was a circle. So there was an altar, it was a round altar that was in the center of the church and all the pews were all the way around and he just kept doing this through the entire mass because this was the only way that he could, he could look at everybody during the mass and so, you know, it, it kind of felt like, uh, what's the name of the, the theater that, um, that Shakespeare um, used to perform in? Uh, that was a round theater and, and it rotated, you know, kind of like these fancy restaurants you see on the top of a skyscraper that rotate. I was expecting the, the altar to start rotating so that you could see it. And there was a swimming pool next to the altar, okay, where they would do the baptisms, all right? And so, you know, people would dive in. And, but the part that really alarmed me was uh, what they used for communion. It looked like a loaf of pumpernickel. It was this 
big loaf and they're just ripping it apart. Now, mind you, in the Eastern Rites, they use leavened bread. Okay, but this was not an Eastern Rite church. This is a Latin Rite church. They're supposed to use unleavened bread in the Latin Rite church. And I remember having a conversation with this friend of mine afterwards, like a year later, because I didn't want to spoil his big day for him, right? Uh, and he said, "So what did you what did you think of the of the mass?" I said, "Well, I said it was it was fascinating, you know." And he said, "Well, <coughs> he said, well, what do you mean?" And I said, "Well." And by this time, you know, he 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 had become strong enough in his faith that I could I could start to point out some things, and it wasn't gonna it wasn't gonna shake him. And I said, "Well, I have co some concerns about whether or not you actually received the Eucharist when you went up for your first communion. I don't know if that was actually your first communion or not." He said, "What do you mean?" I said, "Well, the church has very specific guidelines about what matter is to be used in the mass." He said, well, I don't understand. It was bread. I said, but was it just bread? I mean, it might have been some kind of cake because it did taste kind of sweet. And I don't recall. I think, I think the, the bread that's used in the Latin rite is supposed to have only four, only four ingredients. Uh, it's uh, flour, oil, water, and I believe it's salt. Yeah. Those are the only four ingredients. There's not supposed to be any sugar. There's not supposed to be any raisins. I can't remember. I, I don't think there were raisins in this. There's not supposed to be any dyes. Okay, but I swear to you, it looked like a big loaf of pumpernickel. Okay, and and I said I don't know if if that was valid. And he said, "What? Well, but I mean, I believe that it was. You know, and and the priest believes that it was." I said, "Well, I hope he believes that it was. You know, I don't know that. I, I mean, I didn't talk to him." Um, he said, well, but what does it matter? I mean, you know, wouldn't God understand? You know, it's not my fault. I said, look, I said, here are the facts, okay? Just like, wh wh why, can't we, why can't we ordain women? Why can't the church ordain women? Because Christ didn't give the apostles the ability to ordain women. Regardless of what the apostles actually wanted, Christ didn't give them the ability to do it. So they don't have the authority to do it. They can try to ordain women, but the women aren't actually going to be ordained. You can use the words, you can go through all the motions, but, you know, they're not actually ordained. In the same way, I said, Steve, the priest can't transubstantiate a pork chop. Okay? It doesn't matter how badly he believes and how badly he wants that pork chop to become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus did not give him the authority or the power to take a pork chop and turn it into Jesus. He did give him the power to do that with bread under, circum under certain circumstances using the appropriate form and matter. And he was like, so apparently he now shares the story with all his friends. He goes, yeah. You know, when he, when he he's evangelizing, because Jesus did not give the apostles the authority to turn pork chop into his body. You know, you can't transubstantiate a pork chop. And I was like, well, you can't do it with donuts either. Okay. I mean, Jesus could do it, right? If he wanted to, he could do that. You know, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they can do that if they want. But they didn't give that authority to any of us. They didn't give Father Broheimer that authority. They didn't give, you know, Archbishop Lucas that authority. They didn't give Pope Francis that authority. I mean... John Paul is a saint, but when he was here on earth, he couldn't take a jelly donut and turn it into Jesus. He just didn't, he didn't, he, God didn't give him that gift. I mean, if he did, we don't know about it, okay? <laughs> but I, there's no evidence to that, right? And so I had concerns about that. So to your question, do people say this? The answer is yes. I've heard people say it. I've seen it happen, okay? And, and as I mentioned at the beginning, the Second Vatican Council gets all kinds of credit as well as blame for things that have happened since 1965, some of which is well-deserved and some of which is totally misapplied. Vatican II said, I don't need to wear a cincture under my chasuble. No, we didn't. But I've heard priests say that. Vatican II said that I can make up whatever Eucharistic prayer in an afra I want. No, it didn't. Vatican II didn't say that. Maybe somebody told you that. But the Second Vatican Council never said that. 
Vatican II said that Muslims and Jews and Christians are all the same. No, Vatican II didn't say that. Vatican II did say that Muslims, Jews, and Christians all worship the one God. The same God. We just don't all understand him the same way. And the church has the fullness of the truth, whereas the Muslims and the Jews have parts of the truth. But that's very different than saying we're all the same. And so, you know, you see these, these myths and these misunderstandings and these, and these, uh, these misperceptions and misattributions. What about when they turn the mass around to face the people? Ah, that's, we're going to get into that. We're going to get, that's a great question. That's a great question. And, and actually, that's when that happens. yes, when you read um, Sacrosanctum Quincilium, I think you're going to be surprised at some of the elements that are in there that seem to run contrary to what everybody's told you Vatican II actually said. And you'll be like, well, wait a minute. I wasn't told this. I was told Vatican II said this instead. And that's one of the elements that, that, that we're going to touch on. Come back in January. So we're yes. going to this year with the documents of Vatican II, and then in January we'll go through the actual process where, whereby the new mass was created and yes. trace how we got from Vatican II to what we got. Yep. Yes. So the, the myths that you pointed out in your notes yes. are not specific to Catholicism. This is exactly what was going on in evangelical Protestants. Yes. Is this, is this modernism? It is. That's what you're seeing. You're seeing the influence of modernism on the whole world. And so remember, when, when John the 23rd called for the council, I mean, yes, he was calling together Catholic bishops and cardinals and priests and deacons and Catholic theologians. But remember, he also invited a bunch of non-Catholics. Why? Because the message of the church isn't just for the church. The message of the church, the gospel, is for the whole world. Because what, is, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to go out and make disciples. Right? And so what you're seeing here is the church's response to the attacks of modernism, to, to the enemy's attempt to undermine the truth, which it seems in some circles has been successful at least for now, right? And obviously I would argue, uh, I love the way that Tim Staples puts it. He says, you know, when you start to get worried about the world falling apart and about the church falling apart, he goes, I don't worry about it because I've read the book and I know the ending and I know who wins. You know, and I, I, that may seem a little bit simplistic, but sometimes simple is what we really need. And in those moments when I start to despair about some of the things I read about or hear about or some of the things I see, you know, when I, when I, go, to, when I, when I go to churches, uh, I mean, I attended Mass recently uh, at a church where the only person in the sanctuary, um, the only, well, how do I, how do I describe this? Uh, the priest wasn't the only one doing priestly things. How about I put it that way? And there were a whole bunch of tasks and roles that are rightfully only the purview of the priest that were, be, were being carried on by a whole bunch of other people. Now, I understand, but don't get me wrong, okay? Those people aren't evil, right? I'm not, I'm, I'm not suggesting that. I, I was praying. I spent a lot of time praying for them. You know, God gave me plenty to pray for in that mass. You know, um, they were misguided because they misunderstood because they hadn't read any of this. They hadn't. They weren't familiar with the council documents because, you know, and this may sound harsh when I say this, and maybe the reality is harsh, but we as Catholics in America, we really suck at catechizing our own. We're terrible at it. And so should it come as any surprise that we see liturgical abuse and, and heresy left and right when people haven't been taught the truth? But how can they be taught the truth if there isn't somebody that knows the truth to teach them? And so again, that's, that's what the, the council was trying to address. Um, and if we would take the time as, 
as a congregation, as a parish, as an archdiocese, as a nation, to read these documents, we can address a lot of those shortcomings. Now, you know, we have original sin, we have concupiscence, we have the effects of original sin. I'm not saying that, okay, if everybody read the Second Vatican Council, sin would go away. That's not what I'm saying either. Okay, that, that, that would be wrong. But we can address a lot of these concerns by reading what the church actually teaches. Would that make that mass invalid then? It would depend, okay? And so um, when we talk about the validity of the mass, so remember we have to think about validity and uh, whether or not a mass is licit, right? Um, so, for instance, uh, like what would be a really good example? Um, if... If I made a cheeseburger, this is, this is a pretty basic analogy, and uh, I'm not saying that the church is the equivalent of a cheeseburger. I'm just using it as an analogy, okay? So if I made a cheeseburger, and, you know, and I said, okay, I work at Burger King, and I'm going to make a cheeseburger, but we ran out of meat. So we're going to borrow some meat from McDonald's next door because my brother runs the McDonald's. Okay, would it still be a cheeseburger if we used the meat from McDonald's? Yes, so it's a valid cheeseburger. But is it a licit you know, Burger King cheeseburger? No, because not all the elements of the Burger King cheeseburger are there. It's still a cheeseburger, but it's not really a Burger King cheeseburger. It's kind of this hybrid, okay? And so when we talk about the mass, there are certain elements of the mass that need to be present in order for the mass to be valid. And really, when we talk about the validity of the mass, the primary focus is on the Eucharist, right? Because that's, that's the whole point of the mass. The whole point of the mass is the Eucharist, right? Um, that's why we call it the sacrifice of the mass, because the Eucharist is the sacrifice. And so if you have the proper form and you have the proper matter, then you can have a valid Eucharist. So for instance, the priest can make up all kinds of parts of the Mass. I mean, I've seen some really, really off the wall stuff, you know, um, you know, where the priest, you know, taking different parts of the Mass and putting them in different parts, you know, not doing it in the order in which, you know, the, the Roman Missal says that it should be done. And then, you know, during his homily going around and hugging people and shaking their hands and high fives, all kinds of stuff like that. Okay. And not just the priest, also people within the congregation. I, I've been to Masses like that before. Okay. And then he can make up whatever anaphora he wants and make up the Eucharistic prayer and the epiclesis and leave stuff out. But if he uses the correct words of consecration with the proper matter, with wine and water, and with unleavened bread, the way that the church prescribes, okay, and does it with the intent that the church intends, then that Eucharist is valid. But the Mass is illicit, okay, because he's broken a whole bunch of rules. Illicit means you just broke the rules. Validity means, you know, addresses whether or not, was it actually a Mass? Was it actually the Eucharist? Whether or not a whole bunch of rules are broken, okay? So you can think of, like, liturgical abuses, most of them render parts or maybe all of the Mass illicit, but they don't necessarily render it invalid, it depends on what liturgical abuse it is. So again, if we use the example of a jelly donut, then that would not be a valid, it, you couldn't call it a mass. It, it's not a mass because you don't have the transubstantiation of the bread and the wine into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? If you think about the mass at St. Peter, um, from the moment the deacon kneels, from the moment he stands up, the stuff that transpires in that part of the Mass is what is critical for it to be a valid Mass. Because that's when the priest is actually pronouncing the words of consecration over the matter. Right. So that's that's the point that is key. Exactly. Everything else around that, he can mess all that stuff up and it would still be a valid Mass as long as that portion of the Mass is still wrong. And the Church is very keen um, to, to safeguard that. So I'll give you an example. I, um, you know, my spiritual director... Uh, he is fluent in, I think, seven languages. Um, and he was assigned to help a, um, a new priest who had just learned Spanish uh, to help ensure that he could celebrate the Mass validly 
in Spanish because apparently his Spanish was horrible. I mean, really, really bad. Okay, but my spiritual director and one other priest were assigned to observe this new priest while he was celebrating the Mass to make sure that the words of consecration were pronounced correctly in the proper order and you know, and, and the way that they were intended. And so they spent a lot of time practicing with him the words of consecration. So much so that when he got to that part of the Mass, his Spanish was beautiful. And all the rest of the Mass, his Spanish was horrible. Okay, I mean, they all kinds of grammatical errors and pronunciation errors, but the part that mattered, he got correct. Why? Because the church wants to make sure that the Mass is valid. Because that's the whole reason we're all there. Because the church loves the mass. Because that's where heaven and earth kiss. That's where Jesus makes himself present on the altar. His body, blood, soul, and divinity in a unique way that is a gift to us that we can't even begin to understand. And, and this is some of the stuff, so we're going to touch on this, like toward the end when uh, we're going to be covering the structure of the Mass and, and the influences, you know, in the Mass that we have today. And when we do that, we're actually going to spend some of that time in the church, because what I would like to do is walk you through different architectural elements of St. Peter's and show you where in Scripture and where in Jewish tradition, and where in Catholic tradition, and where in the Council Fathers, and in the early Church Fathers, and all kinds of other stuff, where we see all these elements. So that you walk into St. Peter's, when we're done with this, and you realize, wow, St. Peter's is a 3D catechism. It really is, you know? And, and it's my hope that when we are done, you will attend the Mass, and you could imagine... If you were a first century Jew, you would come and say, this is the fulfillment of all of the prophecies. I'm witnessing all of salvation history in the span of an hour. I'm at the beginning of salvation history. I'm in the temple on Passover. I'm at, I'm at, the, at the foot of the cross on Calvary. I'm in the heavenly Jerusalem. All those things happen in the Mass. And we're going to go over that. But without the Second Vatican Council, we wouldn't have had this push for those elements to be emphasized, and uh, I should say re-emphasized, in our churches and on our masses so that we could get back in touch with the rich treasure which Christ gave us in the Mass. You know, I mentioned earlier, I, I get a little bit passionate about some of these things. I, I think you're probably starting to see some of that, okay? And sometimes I go off on tangents, and so, you know, bear with me. Uh, but I get really excited about this, and, and I know Deacon DeLuca gets really excited about this, too, and sometimes the two of us geek out about this stuff together, you know? Um, and I'm, I, am, I am overjoyed that all of you are willing to geek out with us, so. <laughs> yes, sir. Why isn't this room full? I mean, this is well, is it majority? <laughs> the There's a number of different There's influences. A of, there's a number of reasons. So, so A, we, we've got to uh, do a better job next year of maybe getting the word out a bunch sooner. So we'll, we'll handle that. Yes. Um, and then hopefully maybe figure out some surveys to figure out if this is the best time for people to meet. One of the challenges you have with St. Peter's working at a church. So most of the people don't live, you know, within two or three minutes of the parish. You know, they're, they're in various parts of towns. So we have people driving well over an hour to get here on Sundays. So, right. so that does make some of the EV things a little bit harder to do. So it's just the reality. It is challenging, yeah. which is one of the reasons a lot of people have asked us to put this online so that they can at least have access to it one way or another. And I think we're about to get it online. <laughs> so we've managed to get this. We've managed to get the first three talks, at least, into the hands of uh, Chris Candela, who is responsible for the YouTube channel and the Facebook page. Uh, so I don't know where it stands in terms of him actually posting that stuff. It may already be there. I don't know that I haven't looked into it yet. Um, but I am hoping this weekend to uh, post all of the talks that we've done so far on my YouTube channel 
how to speak Catholic. Uh, so if, if you want to go back and review some of this stuff, um, you'll have an opportunity to do that. Um, now, I will apologize because there were some technical difficulties with the very first one. So there's about two minutes that were cut out because my battery ran out of juice. Um, but since then, I've figured out how to not let that happen. So, uh, and, and so, I mean, this, again, this is something that very much excites me. Um, and it's my hope that it'll excite other people so that, again, we can, we can all be disciple makers. Um, one of the things that I would really very much like to do toward the end of this journey that we're on for this year is survey all of you and then, you know, maybe other people within the parish to find out, okay, what do we want to do next? Yeah, I mean, I've got all kinds of ideas. I mean, I would love to do a series on Genesis as the key to understanding all of Scripture. Have any of you ever thought of Genesis that way before? I mean, when you start to dig into it, it's absolutely amazing. You know, we could, we could spend a whole year just on Genesis. We could spend a year on covenant theology, which I'm sure Deacon DeLuca knows a lot about. Okay, um, I mean that's another you know, another another one of my loves is covenant theology because it's changed the way that I that I look at the whole world and and the whole church. I mean we could spend all kinds of time on mystagogy, which is another you know that that's another area that I that I love dearly. Um, I mean there, there's all kinds of stuff we could do. You know one thing that I'm going I keep saying I'm going to do this for my podcast is one or two episodes on humor in scripture. There's a lot of funny stuff that happens. I mean, funny, ha-ha, not funny as in weird, okay? <laughs> in Scripture, there's a lot of humor. And, you know, I mean, if, if you take a look at St. John, for instance, okay, John's gospel is full of humor. You could see that John was probably a jokester. If you, if you read his gospel closely, you realize he had a great sense of humor. He was probably... The, the prankster amongst the 12. That would be my guess, okay? You know, Peter was the loud mouth. John was probably the prankster. And John makes it clear that Jesus also has a great sense of humor, okay? Everybody thinks Jesus was this stoic guy. He never smiled. John paints a very different picture of him. If you read it like it's the first time you're reading it, you know? So... As we finish up, because I know we just got a few minutes left, I want to jump down here. Um, take a look at some of those myths, okay, when you get a chance tonight. But I want to, as a segue into what we're going to be covering over the next two sessions, I want to take a look at the myths that relate to Sacrosanctum Concilium specifically, okay? Jesus is just as present in the congregation as he is in the Eucharist. How many of you have heard that one before? Okay, I've heard it too. Okay, Jesus, I can worship God anywhere. What do I need to go to church for? I get a lot of uh, people quote wherever two or more are gathered in my name. Yes. I'm present, so that just, That's Matthew chatter 18. What, whatever they want to do. Of course, them. yeah. What they forget though, okay, so I don't remember exactly which verse that is, but it's Matthew chapter 18, okay? The very next verse, however, it, so, the, so it's actually the verse, it's a couple verses before that. So that's the section where it says, you know, if you and your brother have a dispute, then go to your brother. And then if you can't resolve it, then bring two or three others to resolve it. And then if you still can't resolve it, then what? Then go to the Bible. Is that what it says? No. Go to the church. So what is Matthew saying? Are the two or three the same as the church? No, he differentiates those two. And it's immediately following that. He says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. Yes, that's true. But that's not the church. The church is much greater than that. Right? Which church are we talking about? Again, Matthew's gospel. Take a look at Matthew chapter 16. That's the church he's talking about. The church that he built on Peter, who is the rock, against which the gates of hell will not prevail. Okay? That's the church he's talking about. It's the same gospel. It's the same, the same writer. So you can't say, oh, well, no, no, no. It was a different, it was a different gospel writer who is using that, that term in a different way. He's very clear that that's the same church. 
And then John tells us later on, you know, more about, you know, what, what Matthew started with in Matthew 16 and Matthew 18, where he says, you know, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, you loose in heaven. In John chapter 20, he's more specific. He says, whatever sins you hold bound will be held bound. And whatever sins you loose will be loosened. Okay. And he's talking specifically to the apostles. So he gives the authority to bind and loose sins to the, to the first bishops of the church, who then delegate that authority to the priests. One of the, uh, one of the things we often forget is that when the Bible was written, there were no chapters and verses. Yes. So imagine reading it without any of that stuff. Um, I've actually, I should bring with me next time we have class, I've got a edition of it that, that does that. It takes all the chapters and verses out of there, and it reads completely different when you don't have any of that distinction. Which is what it was written. It wasn't written. You know, exactly. Was first. We did that to make it easy to reference, but it, exactly. it, it changes the way you, you, your brain looks at it. Yep. It was largely you know, the work of St. Jerome when he translated it into the Vulgate, you know, where he said, okay, let's, let's make it easier to access this, easier to find stuff. One of the things that saddens me about that is you know, I, I would love to ask St. Jerome, God willing, someday I'll get a chance to do it, and ask him, why did you put the chapter break where you did in the middle of Revelation? At the end of Revelation 11, going into Revelation 12, if you take out the chapter break and you read it without the chapter and the verse, all of a sudden, the church's teaching about Mary as the new ark makes perfect sense. You're like, well, duh, it's right there. But it's deceptive. That chapter break between 11 and 12 is very deceptive. I saw a great sign in heaven. Oh, you know, he says first at the, at the very last verse of chapter 11, you know, I saw the ark. And of course, you know, he's talking to a bunch of Jews. They haven't seen the ark in over 500 years. They're like, you saw the ark? You saw the ark? Where was it? What did it look like? How big was it? Is it the, what it looks like? Is it, is it the way that Moses described it in, in Exodus? I saw the ark and I saw this great sign in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. What is he telling you? What's the ark? The woman clothed with the sun. Right? It's right there. So, yeah, I mean, there's the, you know, that's another rabbit hole we can go down. And I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I love to talk about. But if you take a look at these myths, I would encourage you, you know, as you, before you read um, Sacrosanctum Concilium for our next session, take a look at these myths here in this last paragraph together. Okay? Look at those. And find the answers to those questions. It'll give you something to kind of latch onto as you're reading Sacrosanctum Concilium. Okay? So, one minute. Make sure you read Sacrosanctum Concilium for next time. And then, if you're inclined, as I hope you are, to read all of the documents, Dei Verbum is a great introduction. Lumen Gentium will give you the context for everything else, and then you can jump to whatever other document after that because you'll you'll understand how all the other ones fit together. Those are all on the internet. They're all on the internet. All you have to do is go to Vatican.va, and then in the search box, type in Second Vatican Council, and it'll give you all the documents in whatever language you want. It's even there in Swahili. Keep in mind that the official language is Latin, so I mean, um, yeah, I'm not saying you should read it in Latin, but. There are differences in translations times you'll run across. Yes. I did notice that today. So I was looking at the translation in English versus the one in Spanish versus the one in Italian. And I was surprised at how certain sections were translated differently in, you know, in, the, in the three different languages. And the Italian seemed to be the closest, not surprisingly, seemed to be the closest to the Latin. So. What other questions can I answer for you before we finish up? All right. Well, hopefully this was. You had made a comment earlier about when you were talking about the, the donut mass. Um, yes. Something to remember about the Second Vatican Council. We often think of it as this uh, event that just kind of happened. It took place at a specific historical time and context, the 1960s. So think about what was going on culturally in the 1960s and how people could see the Second Vatican Council as a way to interject some of that other stuff into the church. 
Um, not because the church wanted it, just because, you know, they were fallen creatures, and people kind of latched onto that. So, yes. so often a lot of this criticism that is launched towards the Second Vatican Council doesn't take into consideration everything else that was going on societally that, that caused that, that contributed. Keep in mind also, this is something else for you to think about as you read through the documents of the council. The Second Vatican Council was in some ways laying the groundwork for Humanae Vitae, right? So Pope Paul VI closed the council and then he wrote Humanae Vitae. And if I remember correctly, after he wrote Humanae Vitae, he didn't write anything again after that because he was so discouraged by the, by the reaction of the church and the world to what he had written. But it was really an extension of the, che of the teachings of the Second Vatican Council and, of course, everything else that the church had taught before that. You know, it, it wasn't anything new that he was teaching. He was just reaffirming the truths that the church had been teaching all along and making them more explicit. Uh, but as you read this, See if you can find the elements of the truths in Humanae Vitae previewed here in the documents of the Second Vatican Council. I think you'll find a lot of it in Lumen Gentium. As you may have guessed, Lumen Gentium is my favorite of the, of the documents of the, of the council. Um, it's just amazingly beautiful. In the, the personal call to holiness, which is embodied in Opus Dei, you know, found much of its way into the Second Vatican Council. Um, and that's why, that's why all of us are here tonight, because we all, on, in our own ways, have recognized and responded to that personal call to holiness, or what Lumen Gentium calls the universal call to holiness, it, because there was this misperception at the time of the council. You know, again, there was this divide between the clergy and the lady, that, and this understanding, this misunderstanding, that only priests and bishops and deacons and, and religious were called to holiness. Only they were the ones that were called to be saints. When the reality is that we are all called to be saints, every single one of us. And the Second Vatican Council made that explicit. I should say, made it explicit again. Because the church has been teaching that for 2,000 years. But we needed to hear it again. And that's what the council did. All right. Well, then let's finish up with a prayer. I kept you guys late a little bit, and so uh, I'll ask your forgiveness of that. Okay? <laughs> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for this time of joy and uh, edification, this time of prayer. Uh, thank you for sending the Holy Spirit upon us, um, showing us the, the truth which your Son shared with us while he was here on earth and continues to share with us through his church. Uh, we ask you to continue to guide us and strengthen us and give us the grace um, to understand with joy uh, what it is that you have taught us and to, um, and to live out Christ's command in Matthew 28, 19 to make disciples of all nations so that God willing, uh, at the end of time, we can hear Christ's words to us from Matthew 25. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Welcome into the joy of your master's house. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for your patience and your attention. <laughs>